Welcome to Deep Transformation, Self Society Spirit. I'm Roger Walsh, and our co host is John Dupuy. And today I am just delighted to introduce a guest who has quite literally changed my life over the last year. A year ago, a friend sent me a link to a wonderful collection of readings from some of the great spiritual texts of the world and through of, the, of centuries. And I was just delighted to find this spiritual cornucopia masters and teachers uh, that I had revered for years, in some case decades, now set to beautiful music and read by someone who clearly resonated with these texts in a very, very deep way, who was expressing uh, the and transmitting the wisdom and depth from which they came. And they covered an enormous range. They were texts from, well, basically all the world's traditions, Christian, from Christianity, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa, Julian of Norwich, uh, Thomas Merton, St. Hildegard of Bingen, uh, indigenous uh, readings from the Australian Aborigines, from Black Elk Speaks, Taoist texts, Tuang Tzu, Lao Tzu, Buddhist texts, Islamic texts, uh, uh, readings on death and dying, guided meditations. It's just a cornucopia. So I've spent the last year spending a lot of my time listening to and imbibing and receiving the gift of these texts. And the person who has given us this extraordinary gift is an Australian Buddhist nun by the name of Samaneri Jayasara. And Jayasara, it is such a delight to welcome you to the podcast and thank you so much for what you've given us. It's my pleasure. <laughs> well, well, I can imagine. Actually, is. I've got an Australian accent. That was just me doing. I don't know why I spoke like that. <laughs> my <laughs> pleasure. Delightful. Please continue. <laughs> uh, you know, it's you've given us an incredible gift and and it's a i've used the word cornucopia a couple of times but that's the, that's the word which keeps coming to to me a spiritual cornucopia mm. what do you drew you to record these texts well that's the mysterious question isn't it roger <laughs> something <laughs> did um but you know if i trace it back to how it came to be uh I was reading a, an old journal entry that I'd written when I was at um, Amrawati Buddhist Monastery about 15 years ago, and I'd copied out a section of Padmasambhava's teaching, um, you know, the, the famous text, Self-Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness. And I was reading it and thinking, God, this is amazing. You know, I wrote this out, but the profundity only kind of hit me 15 years later and it kind of it just made me think why why didn't it go in as deeply as it's going in now you know and I thought I just I want to read this whole text so I read it and then listened to it and thought wow you know listening is actually a, it's a, you know, I know this as a teacher I suppose and just you know one's own experience of when you listen to something the dharma because I've been listening to the dharma from different teachers monks and nuns for uh, you know, 20, 30 years, and you're always trained to listen to the Dharma in a, in a specific way, uh, i.e. Not, not necessarily with your intellect or your head. So um, I, I had a sense that, you know, I, I know how powerful the Dharma goes in when you listen. So I just read that, recorded that to myself and listened. And because it's such an incredible text, I mean, it's one of the rarest texts and uh, it just went in so powerfully and you know my whole meditation and insights kind of just flowed on from that and I shared it with another nun in the monastery and she equally found it even more impactful than reading what's already an incredible text to read so then I just started reading some other Buddhist mainly Buddhist at that time but uh, maybe I started reading some Ramana Maharshi too just for myself so I just made some recordings and you know I did have a YouTube an old YouTube membership 
And uh, I don't know what made me do it, but I thought, oh, look, I'll just pop it, pop one up on YouTube. And, uh, you know, it was pretty amateurish and there was a lot of music, too much at that time. And uh, I just thought maybe someone will benefit as much as we did. And then it kind of snowballed from there. And, and you know, you do get feedback on YouTube. In turn, people can comment and give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. And, and so, yeah, there just started to be a level of interest in it. And, you know, I was always joking with the uh, Aya Jatindria, the other nun here, because she'd say things like, oh, I can't remember, but things like you, you should fix up the, the music of that. So don't worry, you know, I'm likely to have 10 subscribers. I don't care, you know. Uh, I'd be lucky to get 100 subscribers and just just thought it was just a bit of a, a novelty and a uh, just a way of connecting with some people out there, but not many. And now it's nearly ridiculously 50,000 subscribers. So I have a little bit more sense of awe, but it needs to be a little bit more polished, you know, so uh, just try and make them a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, a bit more professional in terms of the audio because they were pretty rough at the beginning and it was just a bit of a throwaway thing. Not, I just shouldn't say throwaway because it's the Dharma, but I wasn't concerned about the overall presentation that much. So that's kind of how it started. And then the feedback just kept rolling in a bit like you said at the beginning, it was really changing people's practice and people's lives and the meaning was going in so deeply. Um, so, you know, that, that surprised me. It really surprised me. Uh, uh, yeah. I can't actually, I can't actually hear you, Roger. <laughs> ah, well, that's because I followed the instructions to turn mute myself. <laughs> you forgot the next part. Yeah, turn it back on. <laughs> okay. So I want to do something I didn't do at the beginning. I forgot to mention the title of your series, which is Wisdom the Masters, and it's under your name, Samaneri Jayasara, and it's on both podcast and YouTube. And I also want to follow up on what you were saying about the, the power of the spoken word. Um, you know, we're in a new time in history in which books are so freely available. And we forget that for the last few thousand years, the only way people learned or heard these great texts was hearing them. And as you said, they tend to go in in for, it seems like wisdom goes in in different ways, reading and listening. And uh, in many traditions, uh, there is this, there are these instructions for, and you implied this, I just want, so I just want to draw out what you were saying, that there are skillful ways of listening. One listens and then reflects on what's being heard. One first sets aside the intellect, just lets it wash through then reflects on the ideas, then goes into meditation and pinpointedly focuses on them. And even beyond then may, may stop any, any activity of mind. And, and, and the Christians call it Lectio Divina, listening, uh, li listening, meditatio, reflection, uh, uh, and ending in contemplatio, the, the presence of God. So, I just want to bring out what you were implying there. Yeah, to me, that's one of the most interesting and fascinating things about this whole process because, you know, in the Buddha's day, there was no writing. So he he taught the Dharma in Pali, which, is, which was only a spoken language in those days. So everybody who learnt the Dharma heard it through, you know, a spoken transmission. And... Um, so if you read the if you've read the 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 Theravada suttas the Pali suttas you, so many people woke up or had an enlightenment experience through listening and you know i often reflect on that just how powerful it is and in the zogchen tradition again with padmasambhava given giving teachings pointing out instructions they were always spoken you know there were a few very few people reading as we do now We've got access to so many texts, reading and, and trying to understand that way. And I think it's an incredibly different process 
And it, it goes, I think it goes into the heart in a way that when it goes through the mind and the intellect, there's so much evaluation and, you know, I've been trained, we've been trained to critically analyze, to evaluate, to compare and contrast and weigh things up. And there's so much of the ego and me in there and all that conditioning that gets mixed in with, um, you know, what's really pure Dharma. So when you listen, I think you have a better opportunity to empty out, to really, uh, not always, for some people, their they're, they're head and their they're, they're intellect is still going for it. But when you learn how to listen uh, to the Dharma in, in, in the correct way, it, it is a very different process. And the other thing I was funnily enough reflecting on and talking with the other sister here the other day was that um, during the Buddha's time, it seems so many people, you know, obviously, if you if you get taught directly by the Buddha, you've got a good chance of, of awakening. But putting that aside, so many people used to wake up after a, a sermon or a sutta by the Buddha. You know, they'd talk at the end and he, he or she attained a particular stream, a level of enlightenment or whatnot. And so you're, I, I was often left with this impression that, oh, the people around during the Buddha's day must have been something else, you know, really special and really ripe. And we, we don't quite have the same uh, capacity in this modern world for people waking up. But then I realized that the, the big difference perhaps wasn't their virtue or certainly their intelligence or um, uh, you know, obviously their merit, something about their merit was special to be born in the time of, and to be around a Buddha. But putting all that aside, they, they didn't have the same intellectual blockages and veils that we do. You know, they didn't, they weren't, most of them weren't highly educated or full of books and knowledge. So when the Buddha taught something uh, as uh, clear and profound as as the Dharma in the way that he chose to, to to that particular person, it just it went straight in, and there there weren't those filters, those blocks that um, that I think we have. We have so much knowledge and so much conceptual frameworks and labels and what, and it's just like, whoa, how does it go into the heart? So it just go, it went straight to the heart, and the 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 intellect didn't become a blockage. And I think that's kind of, that's the, that's the main difference in so many ways. We're just too smart. We're just too educated. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to get past all our knowledge to get to the simplicity and the purity of the Dharma. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. once I, I had an interview with an Indian uh, meditation teacher and he said, mm, oh, yes, you are academic. Have you read these, this text, um, these texts? Yes. Do you have a good, good intellectual knowledge of the Dharma? Yeah, well, fairly good. Oh, such a pity. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So the unlearning is what we all need to do. But the interesting thing is Padmasambhava predict, predicted that a lot of these particular termers that are being revealed and a lot of which I uh, are reading would be more suitable for our times because we're so intellectual and um, I'm not sure why why he chose those particular ones but he knew what he was talking about I think and um, they they're simple and they cut through but they also appeal to I think a, a very rational well-educated mind so yeah, it's really interesting that whole process of listening versus reading. And, and how's your how's your experience? You're not just reading and you're not just listening. You're actually speaking the text also. So how is that? Yeah, for you? speaking it or reading it or reading, yeah, it coming through yeah, you. Yeah, again, it's it's a bit like when I read, I don't I don't prepare. And again, it's my tradition in Theravadan, if when the monks and nuns and the Ajahn Chah lineage are always encouraged to, to speak spontaneously, never, if anyone prepared a Dharma talk, like I remember Ajahn Sumedho would say, he, his first Dharma talk he was asked to give as a young monk, and he did notes and, you know, like preparing a lecture or something. And afterward, Ajahn Chah just chastised him and said, that was rubbish, don't ever do that again. You've got to speak from the heart, you know, because that's the authenticity. You're not manipulating. You're not, um, you know, you're not sort of polishing things. And so the Dharma has a chance to be more immediate and more alive 
and more authentic, I think. So when I read, I never read it first and say, oh, okay, I'm going to read it like this. I'm going to speak it like this. So just, you know, you get in the zone, don't you? And you yeah. just you just let it flow. And if I make a mispronunciation, of course, I, I re-record that. But I try not to um, make it contrived. I, I mean, I, I need to pronounce the words as clearly as I can as a, an Australian native because there's a few, <laughs> few things I say that people won't understand. Um, but apart from just having a clear diction and, uh, and, and pronouncing the words correctly, I just don't think about it. So again, it's like the Dharma has to flow. And, uh, may, and, and that obviously that comes through somehow, I suppose, you know. It does. It, it definitely does. Yeah. And it's not polished, you know, it's not, not that polished or anything. But. Well, you, you do, you're giving a transmission. And it comes yeah, well, that's the other thing, isn't it? Yeah, there's a transmission happening, and it's and it's such a a multifaceted one. You're such mm. a rare person <laughs> and a rare Theravadan renunciate yeah. in having exposed yourself very deeply to effectively the world's most profound teachings from yeah. multiple traditions. What drew you to this breadth? It's very rare. Well, again, that's my training because I, I studied comparative religion and spirituality. So I'm not that rare, but I, I'm a rare Theravadan. <laughs> well, well, you're rare, but there's a big difference between studying comparative religion, which is an intellectual enterprise yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> far removed from spiritual transmission, unfortunately, most times. But yeah. you actually immersed yourself in these texts as a for your own spiritual opening i assume I'd, how did how were you drawn to these different this range um i think they were drawn to me you know i just yeah. there people make requests things land in my lap i just kind of open and i'm not you know i do have postgraduate qualifications but i'm so far from an intellectual you know i'm really not that smart intellectually and i i could do my phd in that but i was never really into it so like my head gets a bit tired and my eyes glaze over if i get if there's too many intellectual conversations but you know i've got some knowledge that i've collected most of it i've forgotten um but i've always had an interest in and i mean i was a fundamentalist theravadan don't don't worry about that <laughs> so yeah i've had to get over that and 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 keep my mind and my heart open and realize that you know every every pe every person in every tradition for a time i think thinks well i'm we've got the only truth you know and they're so arrogant and it's so closed minded so um fortunately i've kind of got out of that i mean i'm still very much committed to the theravadan um tradition and i love i love the form but I'm I'm not uh, I'm not of the belief it's it's the the one and only path or the the best or anything or the highest. Could you so, summarize um, what that is for you? Because there may be listeners who are not familiar with that form of of a very ancient Theravada. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess in terms of Buddhism, it's the um, it's known as the teaching of the elders. So it relies on the Pali suttas, which are said to be the closest. Um, uh, resources we have the closest texts we have to what the buddha actually spoke or taught and theravadan buddhism went um spread from india as we know and went to um the main countries were sri lanka thailand burma and i'm not i'm forgetting somewhere else uh laos well into india at the time too or when it left india when it left india it spread so it's it's mm. yeah so the tradition i'm in is mainly the the fo thai forest tradition and um and then of course within theravada there's other other countries where it's spread as well in in a slightly different form <coughs> excuse me i'm having a sneezing attack now you have to edit that out <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question, John? In terms yeah, of it got me, it got me interested for more. But then again, I, I I pretend to be an intellectual, so you just take it as deeper as far as oh, yeah. Well, we can all pretend. <laughs> yes, we can. Yeah. So Theravadan is the school of the elders and the Pali suttas, and it's mainly concentrated in those particular countries that I mentioned. 
And your forest version? You said Thai forest. Forest tradition. Yeah, that's a whole other story. So in Thailand, um, you know, there's a lot of rites and rituals and people not really practicing meditation. So the forest tradition broke away from that and wanted to get back to the core of the practice. So monks like Ajahn Man uh, went into the forest and did the more ascetic practices and took up meditation and were quite critical of the scholars too you know the, the scholar monks and um, said we've got to bring the practice back so in the the forest tradition is traditionally very much focused on practicing meditation not just reading it and studying it, you know uh, putting the books down yeah <laughs> Well, that's why I've never become a renunciate. <laughs> uh, I wonder if this would be a time to listen to one of your readings. Uh, and perhaps uh, I think I think we have a selection from St. John of the Cross, which is one of your most recent uh, recordings. I think you just came out with it last week. So maybe that'll be beautiful to hear. Yeah. In the twilight of life, God will not judge us on our earthly possessions and human success, but rather on how much we have loved. Never give up prayer, and should you find dryness and difficulty, Persevere in it for this very reason. God often desires to see what love your soul has. And love is not tried by ease and satisfaction. In the dark night of the soul, bright flows the river of God. In the inner stillness where meditation leads, the spirit secretly anoints the soul and heals our deepest wounds. Contemplation is nothing else but a secret, peaceful and loving infusion of God, which, if admitted, will set the soul on fire with a spirit of love. Seek in reading and you will find in meditation. Knock in prayer, and it will be open to you in contemplation. Silence is God's first language. However softly we speak, God is so close to us that we can be heard. 
nor do we need wings to go in search of God, but merely to seek solitude and contemplate God within ourselves. Without being surprised to find such a good guest there. So beautiful. That, uh, this exquisite combination of a deep, heartfelt reading set to evocative music. It's such a powerful combination. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exquisite words of St. John the Cross. They just yeah, give rise to that quite naturally too. Yeah. yeah. As the Quakers would say, it spoke to my condition. Thank you. I was not prepared for that. Uh, thank you. Mm. You mentioned that in, in preparing for these, you don't you don't do any kind of formal preparation, but I assume that there's an intention or aspiration that goes with reading. Why can you share something about that? Yeah, I get I, again. I'm not a. I'm not. I don't overthink these things, but uh, it, it's more of a like uh, a heartfelt. Uh, sharing of the Dharma and again this is this is the good conditioning I've been conditioned for uh, since a, you know, since my early 20s to receive the Dharma freely from wonderful teachers uh, in person and obviously you know in text and to to attend retreats where it's not a commercial enterprise you're not charged money um, and so this this has always been a free, free exchange of dharma and uh and realizing through your own practice and transformations how how priceless the dharma is and the buddha spoke about the you know the greatest gift that you can give is the gift of the dharma so it exceeds all other gifts and it's not that i set out thinking great i'm going to give the highest gift but it just uh it, it gives itself you know and i've, I've received so much over the years and maybe it's just my time to share. That's all. That's how I see it. You know. Uh, and if it's helping people, that's that's the motivation. Like more than I guess. I don't know if you read some of the comments on YouTube, but there's some really lovely, heartfelt sharings of people, what they've been through, like the dark night of the soul, as Saint John talked about, and how these have helped. These uh, pointers, these teachings, have helped them through some really uh, difficult periods. And people, you know, having all sorts of insights through them. So that's that's enough, isn't it? You know, that that's enough to inspire you to keep going. And I didn't think I'd be making such a huge library, but uh, it's it, I'm, I'm quite prolific. But as I said, I, I don't do anything. <laughs> I don't have any other commitments, any children. You know, this is my work. This is my service. So. Uh, and it's a joy for me to do it. And I, I get so much out of it too. You know, I listen to myself uh, re reading it for obviously for quality control, but also for my own practice. So it's a win-win. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's a, uh, as, as some traditions would say, to give is to receive. So yeah, I'm exactly. sure that this uh, your giving is, is also receiving. Yeah. Uh, what drew you to the contemplative life? Hmm. I think suffering initially, a, a kind of awakening to suffering, and I mean that. And the Buddhist, you know, I guess that's why the Buddha did focus on the four noble truths as the the, the kind of the primary teaching. Is there was an awareness in me. Um, not so much at a, when I was a child, because as a child, I was uh, a young child. I was really kind of happy and connected with with nature and just being, you know, there was a naturalness of joy. Yeah, there was a natural joy in me as a child. I mean, there was moments of suffering within the family dynamics, but they they weren't intense and they, 
you know, they passed over quickly. But I think once I hit uh, my teenage years, leaving school and just feeling that I hadn't really got that much in terms of understanding the profundity of life. I, I was raised a Catholic and went to Catholic schools all my life. So, you know, I had a, some good teachings in terms of kindness and morality and, um, you know, the, the mystery of Jesus's teachings. But I, I don't think it really, I don't think I really got it at a, at a profound level. And um, I think it was once I hit my late teens, early 20s, I just thought, uh, experienced suffering within you know, myself in terms of, uh, just that existential crisis of what are we doing? You know, where there's so much emphasis on, on accumulating money and wealth and just getting married and doing what everybody else does, renovating the house. And, and it just hit me when I was 21. I thought on my 21st birthday in particular, I just thought, God, we're all going to die. What are we doing? You know, no one's talking about death. And I, so I was contemplating death a lot. And, uh, through some acid trips, LSD trips, it kind of brought that to the fore to me too and um, had some bad acid trips. And I was obviously searching through some fairly unskillful means to answers to questions. But uh, uh, and yeah, so then I was fortunate, I suppose, as a life-saving tool too, I came across the Buddha's teachings and Krishnamurti's teachings. And I was, I think I was in my second or third year of an undergraduate course in politics, which wasn't speaking to me at all. And uh, so I just started reading Krishnamurti. I think I read every single book in the Latrobe Uni library of his. And it's like, finally, someone's speaking the truth, you know, and, you know, in a really clear cutting, cutting way, cutting edge way of cutting through all the nonsense and the delusion and equally reading the Buddhas. So, but I came, I think I came through it through suffering really just dissatisfaction with the the way what the world was offering and my own internal processes of confusion and delusion and you know greed hatred and delusion and uh finally had some answers clear answers to look at and to take responsibility too that you know i could only do this by going within i, I wasn't going to change the world you know the world will be what it'll be and if I wanted to come out of suffering, I had to go within uh, rather than start fighting the world without. So that, that's how it came about. And you were exposed to, at that stage, Buddhist practices? Is that, that was that a turn? Yeah, to? yeah, I did. Um, I, I had a, a massive library at La Trobe. So I, that's where I found Krishnamurti and, and, and Buddhist texts I was in somehow I wasn't in this in the politics rows I was I ended up in the philosophy rows and was choosing books from that but then I, practically I also undertook 10 day Vipassana retreats when I was um 21 I think I was 21 and uh that that changed my life and they're so powerful you know they're probably a bit too powerful in many respects for people but it, it Practically that, uh, you know, 10 days of re intensive retreats, 11 hours on the cushion per day for 10 days, just, well, it can't help, you know, have a huge transformation on your life. So I, that, I didn't stop meditating after that, really. That was the practical. And I was trying to integrate the, inter the intellectual, the, the conceptual understanding with the the practice of meditation and that's why I went on to study comparative religion and Buddhism not because I wanted to be an academic and I never was but uh, it gave me an excuse not to get a full-time job <laughs> <laughs> I could stay as a student and do do uh, as many retreats as I wanted and because uh, the emphasis in Vipassana and, in, and still is I think it was like do retreat after retreat after retreat so I became a bit of a retreat junkie and um and then I, uh, after Vipassana, I moved more into to, to a Buddhist practice, you know, because Vipassana, even though it uh, teaches uh, Anapanasati and s some of the insight practices, it doesn't declare itself as a Buddhist uh, 
organisation. It tries to just stay rather secular. So I had to kind of put all these pieces of the puzzle together, you know, to realise, oh, they're actually teaching Buddhism, but they don't want to call it Buddhism. Um, and uh, so I, and I didn't, I, you know, I, I wasn't ashamed to, to, to adopt the Buddhist practice. So I, you know, I, I linked more then after a few years with uh, the monastics within, within Buddhism. Yeah. So you're describing your own unique path and, and life openings. And in, yet in many ways, they are probably reminiscent of uh, commonalities to many people's paths, you know, a period of, of uh, disorientation, of awakening to the, to the pain and suffering that each of us faces simply by being born into a body which ages, sickens and dies, but also the collective suffering, the enormity of pain in the world, so much of it absolutely unnecessary. And so you had that confrontation. And fortunately, you had available to you some, something which 50 years ago just wasn't an option in Western culture, which is amazing to think about. You know, we, we tend to think, or at least I'm in San Francisco, where practically every one of the world's <laughs> contemplative practices is available in every spiritual tradition. Yet we tend to forget how rare that is. And a friend and I were reflecting on, okay, well, when was the last time there was a place in the world like San Francisco? And the best we could come up with was Alexandria 2000 years ago, which was a meeting place of the world's mm -hmm. traditions. But we forget how extraordinarily uh, privileged we are to have the the world's contemplative practices and teachings available to us for the first time in millennia and to be able to choose to be able to walk to a library or to a bookstore and pick up a text from Ramana Maharshi or any one of the great traditions and to also have teachers who can expose us to these practices so uh, so this is just a rare gift and and you made use of that you dove into one one particular tradition and sounds like that's been your your portal your doorway into uh, into the spiritual uh, practice very intense spiritual practice yeah yeah it's interesting what you say about how much we're spoilt for choice aren't we but i don't think people realize just how fortunate we are and and i guess the danger with spiritual and we're seeing it's happened it's become spiritual materialism so people are trying to make a buck out of it or become a you know a new age guru and there's, there's a lot of stuff that's being uh, defiled about it but that i guess that's just part of the human nature too but there's um yeah just to to have access to such real authentic teachings and so much it's, it's kind of incredible Yes, and mm -hmm. you said it well. There's a saying: "Whatever can be misused will be misused." And <laughs> it's human nature. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I really want to emphasize that one of the uh, gifts of your readings is that they are offered with completely free of charge, complete without any expectation of return. They say they are your gift to the world, and an exquisitely beautiful one at that. And I, yeah. I just love the spirit with which you're offering these. Yeah, good, great. Yeah, and, and if any any small way we can, uh, what we're doing here right now will help more people be able mm. to yeah, experience the medicine that uh, I experienced at one time, and I was just, uh, I was floored. It was very. Well, you, you're not listening on um, YouTube yet, John. No, I, no, this oh, is, I just came with you know, right. beginner's mind. Let's see what's going to happen. Good and idea, beginner's soon, mind. As soon as you started talking, when I'm such a rookie, where's my, you know, where's my Kleenexes around here? I'm oh, going to completely sweet. lose it. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't realize that. I thought you'd been listening to the to the recordings for a while or something. No. Oh no! I, I, oh, you got a bit of catching up to do. There's about four hundred of them. <laughs> I'm so excited. That's such a great gift. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I've listened enough for both of us. So, John, you can, <laughs> you can get a free ride on this one. But I, I suspect you'll be listening to a lot from now on, as yeah. many of my friends have. I've certainly I've certainly been advocating, and I do want to I do want to mention, John. You you uh, raised the point of wanting to support JSR and the work she's doing. And one can, as I am, uh, become a 
patron and support this work or, or simply offer donations to to support the, the hermitage which ASR resides in and uh, support the practice of the nuns. So there are ways in which we can support you. And, and the way we want to support you right now is by in this conversation is getting this out, getting the word out to as many people as we can. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, uh, good. There was something I was going to say in, in, re in response to, <coughs> to all the different traditions too. It's just sometimes listening to say St. John of the Cross or another tradition that you might be a little bit familiar with or not familiar with at all, to hear the teaching expressed uh, in another way, a different conceptual framework, and you sort of, it can be really um, fresh in your practice too. Because, you know, when you listen to that excerpt of St. John, I could write that in Buddhist languages, you know, uh, or Advaita language. It's just a different way of expressing it, but it, they're all pointing to the same ultimate truth. And I really love the Christian uh, way of expressing it and the humility I think that comes through in a lot of the saints uh, and even though it sort of sounds a little bit dualistic with yourself and God the the ones that really went deep like St John of the Cross they transcended that duality and you know the realization was that that divinity was within and that and that truth is within it's not something separate from you and uh, so for me I think that's why I like to widen my a scope and open my mind to all the traditions because it it, it it adds it enlivens your practice i think because you can get stuck in ruts can't you and condition ways of thinking or conceptualizing truth and these uh these other traditions can can really help freshen it up and, and well, again, I, just, your, sorry go on. oh i was gonna say i'm somewhat familiar with saint john of the cross uh my journey started out uh in a Christian groove, but moved on from there. But I've never been touched by him like happened here. So uh, anyway, I keep going back to that, but that was really extraordinary for me. Beautiful, yeah. And I want to- uh, uh, I can't hear, I can't, I, have you muted yourself? Sorry, I muted myself. I said, you saw it live here, folks. <laughs> you God did? just had an awakening. <laughs> <laughs> there's hope for us all <laughs> live on zoom amen, <laughs> amen. Uh, JSR, i want to bring out something that you mentioned uh, in, in passing and that is the the way in which exposure to different traditions can enrich our practice and i remember ramdas who was one of my teachers years ago and really a very important uh, uh, mentor for me he said that there is a flow and rhythm to spiritual life. And when you first begin, it's great. Maybe you want to take a smorgasbord approach and just uh, as we can for the first time in millennia, we can expose ourselves to different traditions and teachers and, and depths. And so great, you know, dine at the smorgasbord, but then at a certain point, it may be appropriate and you may feel called to dive deeper into one tradition to really give yourself offer yourself to an immersion in a particular kind of practice or, or or tradition and do that for as long as you feel called and then at a certain time you may notice exactly what you said Joe Sarah then there's a, maybe it's getting a little stale in some way and then again you may be drawn to a fresh perspective an alternate way of seeing things a different vocabulary a different depth and that can be a delightful enrichment of practice. And perhaps you'll go back to where the tradition you were in originally, or perhaps you'll find another one that pulls you for at this stage of your life. And each of us has our own unique path, but he, he emphasized so beautifully a, a follow it to follow one's heart and inner guidance as to mm what felt most appropriate at each stage of spiritual life. We, we emphasize that we, you know, we all have reservoirs of wisdom within us that we don't usually recognize or access, but when we do, we have a guy in a, in a radar. Mm. And that radar guides us to, as it did you, to different teachers and, and texts and, and uh, enriches us in so many ways. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, Ram Dust had just such a be exceptionally beautiful way of expressing Dharma, didn't he? He's, he was exquisite. Yeah. 
Oh, really he did. Good. He was a major influence on me. I had the good fortune of yeah. uh, yes. uh, actually the first retreat I ever went to was with him. I was very fortunate. He was very poetic in his expression of Dharma. I love that. Um, there's a few things floating on YouTube, recent recordings of him, not me, but other channels that have um, put him to music, and it's just beautiful. He's lovely. Yeah. So I, I have a question for you, Jaya Shara. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, how do you how do you select your texts? How do they come to you? I don't. They just come. <laughs> no. I, I, people, I, I mean, I've got a list this long. You can't see this on podcast, can you? Say, I got a really long list, and uh, from people requesting. And I can never make promises. It just, it depends what presents itself and um, uh, sort of, yeah, sometimes I have dreams that of, of, uh, of a spiritual teacher and that, that will prompt me. Or someone will mention it and I'll think, oh, I must get around to record, recording another Ananda Maima or something. But it's, I don't, I don't, um, I don't have any plans. It just whatever feels right. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty kind of loose, loose going. A bit like this interview, you know. Wherever it goes, we we'll just go with it. <laughs> so we do it. But clearly, the texts you read are ones that speak to you in some way because you're able to. Uh, it feels like open to resonate with and transmit their depths. Yeah, they, 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 what's so interesting about that, Roger, is that um, at one level, of course, I have to resonate with it. But sometimes, you know, I've read something and I think, oh, I, I, I think that didn't resonate. I don't get it. And then I go back and listen. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's amazing. You know, it goes because it, it, I might be initially unfamiliar with the languaging or, or the structure. And it's that's happened a few times. So I'm never, I'm never, you know, absolutely convinced by my first uh, impression. If I if I think, well, that that, that wasn't so good, and not so much how I read it, but whether it resonated for me. And then, uh, you know, just keep the mind open because sometimes there's been a few that have really blown me away. Uh, so. Having said that, I've had a few requests for some some spiritual teachers, and you know, I might check them out because I'm interested. I haven't heard of them, and then either the teaching hasn't resonated, or I've done some research and they had a fairly dubious, um, made a few dubious comments, and I just I'm not going there, you know. So um, I got to I've got to use my discernment. I'm not just open to anyone and everything. I try and really. Not that I can validate all these masters as 100% <laughs> awakened and pure, but just be a little bit discerning because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of dodgy stuff out there too. So I tend to um, stick with the ones who are dead. That's safe. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah they, they don't get into more trouble. <laughs> no, I, want, I, I, do, once, I, sorry, I was going to say, I once said I prefer my spiritual teachers dead. Uh, much just safer. for that reason yeah it's much safer i don't want to go promoting anyone and then find out 10 years down the track they've had a huge list of sexual allegations or something like that against them which you know happens in the spiritual tradition so yeah no just uh yeah, yeah and you can you can sort of feel too that if someone's really authentic it, and, and a lot of these are translations too so you you know you've got all those things to to take into to account but there's a certain power I think that comes through when you're really in in the vicinity of an authentic spiritual master and their words are there and, and you feel it and you think you no know, they they were they were the real deal you know so um yeah and it, and it, you seem to have found and and read from some of the other teachers who really are speaking from enormous depth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we I don't know how much we want to get into this, but I think one of the things that's getting clear to us is we now have a better understanding of, of spiritual practice, of psychological maturity, of psychological health, of spiritual well-being, of the stages of adult development, that, that different texts and, and teachings and traditions even speak from different perspectives, different 
depths of opening and awakening and even different psychological le levels totally. and we're just beginning to map that out uh, but you seem to have you seem to have gravitated towards teachers of extraordinary profundity who are transmitting uh, really some of the great uh, tr great depth with enormous clarity and and in many cases clear compassion yeah, I think clarity and um, compassion and also if if they're the real deal, there's a certain, I don't want to say, sim well, yeah, there's a certain simplicity. It's it's uncluttered, you know, and you really feel that. So by the end of, if it's just an excerpt or, you know, a whole complete teaching, you kind of get to the end of it and your mind feels in the same way, uncluttered and clear. And it, it doesn't, you know, Dharma truth is not, complicated we make it complicated and complex but it's not and so these teachers because their insights are you know were were authentic and 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 real that gets that purity gets communicated so you know you should feel at the end of it having read it or i should that hey i feel as clear and you know calm and compassionate and and um, uncluttered as what's being conveyed here in this message you know. You're talking about transmission, which is something that each tradition uh, acknowledges as a possibility that in the, in the presence of someone who is awake or yeah. mature, who has a clear mind, a pure heart, that, that, those, that, that those qualities of heart and mind can elicit the same or at least similar states mm. and openings uh, as they themselves are speaking from so there's this you know we, and, and of course from neuroscience psychology interpersonal psychology we now know that we're like tuning forks we resonate to one another's state of mind and yeah. and as the saying goes be careful who you hang out with because you'll become like them and even look like them and so but here we have have the this made use of in the best possible way in these traditions that that these people who have spent in some cases decades cultivating the deepest openings of of mind and spirit the pure greatest purity of heart and the and the purest of intentions can tr do transmit to the extent we're open to it those same qualities so uh, in as much as we can resonate with them and have them and open to at least a certain extent to those same states and stages it's amazing isn't it especially when you do consider how ancient some of these teachings are and that they've been through a few quite a few hands and a few different translators but the power is obviously still there coming through through all those mm -hmm. different cultural contexts and whatnot well, yeah, also, the, also your voice. We talked about that earlier, but yeah, there's a, there's a definite transmission. And in the Christian tradition, we say you're anointed for this. You know, you have a gift for this. And you could have a professional actor, you know, just professionally trained and, um, you know, sound great and not pull off what you were able to pull off. I mean, I have a very little small sample of your work, but I was, I was, I was touched very deeply. So that's, that's something. And, uh, yeah, but it's not me. That's the thing. And that's what I my practice has to always come back to, because if people people writing all sorts of uh, things on YouTube about me and, you know, and how and I, I'd certainly open to their gratitude and their uh, appreciation. I love that. But I have to be really careful. It's not about me and it's not something special about my voice or my personality or anything it's just uh if that comes into it then the whole thing's going to be sullied and so it's constantly remembering that this is just i'm just a channel for this and uh if it's helpful that's great but it's uh it's got nothing to do with me well and that's why it works you know yeah, that's exactly, yeah. That's, that's, you've got the secret right there you know that that's yeah it. <laughs> well, maybe it's time to give John a, a second awakening and, and play, <laughs> play another reading. Hey, so my, I, have my, I have my Kleenex. I'm ready. No, no, no. Now you're going to go in with expectations, you see. This is the problem with spiritual practice, isn't it? Now you're going in, oh, I had that experience. I want it again. 
Yeah, I want it better this time. Give me more. Give me more, more, more. more. <laughs> it puts a blockage <laughs> to us, to us, isn't it? I'm not talking about you in particular, but it's just, it's a good teaching for, ah, oh, that was wonderful. I want that again. And now I'm expect. And then that, they're those, those things that always block it, isn't it? Our expectations, our, our memories, our perceptions, our conditioning. So for you to have that experience was, yeah, you were complete beginner's mind. You had not, you didn't have any, preconceptions about what you were going to listen to or what was going to happen and wow great don't expect it again though john i won't <laughs> i promise uh, let's listen i think this next one is from tuang su the great Taoist sage If you persist in trying to attain what is never attained, if you persist in making efforts to obtain what effort cannot get, if you persist in reasoning about what cannot be understood, you will be destroyed by the very thing you seek. To know when to stop. To know when you can get no further by your own action. This is the right beginning. You can never find happiness until you stop looking for it. My greatest happiness consists precisely in doing nothing whatever that is calculated to obtain happiness. And this, in the minds of most people, is the worst possible course. If you ask what ought to be done and what ought not to be done in order to produce happiness, I answer that these questions do not have an answer. There is no way of determining such things. Yet, at the same time, if I see striving for happiness, the right and the wrong at once become apparent all by themselves. Contentment and well-being at once become possible the moment you cease to act with them in view. And if you practice non-doing, Wu Wei, you will have both happiness and well-being.
beautiful. Beautiful. Oh. That was. Uh, go ahead, Roger. No, go ahead, John. I was going to say that helped me in another area of my life very much, and that's my tennis game. Thank you. <laughs> I, I needed that. I've seriously been hitting a wall with this, and uh, that really spoke to that. And it has been it is a path for me that I have passion for, and so I work hard at it. And I've been playing horribly, trying so trying hard. Too hard. Yeah, trying too hard. It's exactly what I needed to hear, and just give me the joy back of of the thing in itself. Yeah, there's something uh, that's so profound about that level of teaching. There's, it seems like there's a, a certain stage on contemplative path, there's a 180 degree. At first you start off working and practicing and striving and cultivating particular qualities and trying to hone the mind and point it in the right direction and get it to do what you want. And, and then it is, and cultivate qualities of very wonderful qualities of heart and mind. And then at a certain stage, there's this recognition that all these qualities are actually latent within us. And that it's more about allowing them to emerge and flourish. And the Taoists speak so beautifully to that. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps they have, not the corner on the market of that, but perhaps it's one of their great, greatest emphases. And I think it's also with any of the masters that I, I choose anyway, um, <clears throat> I think it's just a reflection of the great masters. They, they all kind of get to the, you know, they're try, trying to save us a lot of trouble and, and dukkha of stress, you know, by saying, hey, it's, it's right here and now. You just have to recognize it. And you don't have to go shopping or twisting yourself in knots or, you know, getting lost in all these rites and rituals. It's just um, wake up to it now. And their, their language and their pointers were so clear and so compassionate. Uh, and, and that's why I think, you know, I, I tend to gravitate towards those, those masters who say that. Because I think any great master will save you a lot of time. <laughs> You know, you don't have to subscribe to my particular methodology or do this or do that. And I guess there's a, as you say, there's perhaps a, a time, a, a stage in the path. Of preliminary practices are helpful for beginners to perhaps purify the mind and um, stabilize the mind. But if if one is able to just uh, open to it in the here and now and recognize it, and then practice from that state of simplicity that's uh you know i wouldn't have mind heard it hearing it when i first started out but perhaps i wouldn't have got it either you know well i certainly wouldn't have and i yeah, exactly. you know, and i yeah. had a have, have had a very striving personality and by a strange coincidence brought that into my practice and to the point that i literally in a, in a long three-month retreat literally burnt out very badly mm. and and as it turned out, there was an inherent, a latent wisdom within that because given how committed I was to striving and achievement, it took coming to a point where I literally could no longer do that before it, it dropped away. And then I could recognize, oh, there's the possibility of being resting. as opposed to becoming yeah. and resting yeah. as opposed yeah. to struggling, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I was exposed to those ideas many times, but they certainly didn't connect with me. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I guess we just have to go on our own path and and tie ourselves up in knots to the until we kind of, as you say, burn yourself out or just let go and surrender. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and hopefully, you know, with with teachings like this, we can we can uh, make that transition more quickly, or at least have a somewhat easier time, save ourselves some time. But mm. there is a there, there is a deeper question here, JSR, and that in Zen it would be referred to as the the debate between the sudden enlightenment and gradual enlightenment schools, and mm. and and if one. You know, one hears so many stories, particularly in Zen, you know, so-and-so was sweeping the monastery floor and a tile 
broken, you know, he awakened. Well, good luck. I, uh, I've swept a lot of floors. <laughs> Nothing's happened. So there is, you know, there is this delicate question of, do we have to, as you implied, go through a significant amount of practice before we can let go that the, the striving and even the necessity for for honing and training and refining the heart and mind yeah but I, I think people make the assumption that we're just this is our first life of practice you know it's like how many lifetimes have we been practicing and deepening our spiritual understanding and burning ourselves out and following the wrong path and so on and uh, you know unless you have direct insight into that we don't know but and with Ramana Maharshi, because, you know, he awakened at 16 and then uh, left the world and went into deep samadhi and perhaps went a little bit off the path himself with, um, you know, just letting his body go to rot nearly and people had to keep him alive, but he'd let go so completely. But he'd say to people, you know, my, this has been accumulating for many lifetimes. His sudden awakening happened not because... 14 he started practicing or whatever but because he was bringing in those uh, lifetimes of practice so he's he was ripe so we don't know we don't know when the fruit's going to fall from the tree and even though that zen story of sweeping the monastery with the sudden enlightenment it's not so sudden if you could see back lifetimes ago you know yeah, well even within this lifetime what those those texts forget to mention is the monk had been there for 20 years <laughs> and oh, swept, yeah, exactly. swept the floor a lot of times before exactly. that happened <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly you mentioned lifetimes and that of course mm. brings up the topic of death and you have a number of readings on the topic of death preparing for it would you say something about those readings or your understanding of those topics on death, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's 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 a very powerful uh, practice that all the great masters would encourage people to to undertake consciously. To because you know, especially in Western culture, we try and forget about it and push it aside as much as possible. So the death contemplations, um, uh, well, for me, as I said, when I was in my twenties uh, or teenage years, I was obsessed with death. Didn't quite know why, um, but uh, obsessed with it in the sense I wasn't suicidal or anything like that, but just like, wow, we're going to die, you know, and what happens when you die and why? how come we're living these lives and no one's talking about death? And I remember with my friends when I was 19 wanting to talk about death and they just said, oh, you're so morbid, you know, and no one wanted to talk about it, but I just wanted to contemplate it. So um and I think if, if someone, you know, if you obviously if you lose someone close to you, you've got no choice but to, to feel into that yeah. and to contemplate it. But uh, in, in terms of the spiritual practice, it, it is something that can really shift the delusion around uh, the identification with the body because the, there's so much fear around death because we're so sure we feel that we are these bodies and it's these bodies when these bodies die, it means I'm going to die and I'm going to lose everything. And uh, so contemplating death is a way of waking up, isn't it? Of, uh, you know, we are not these bodies. And what are these bodies? And using those uh, brilliant spiritual contemplations that the Buddha left us and uh, many of the great masters to really to look at each aspect of the body and, and our relationship to death and many people wake up through through the death contemplations it's not you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be morbid but people have to uh, look at their fear and and go beyond it so and i've had a number of requests on youtube to create that playlist so i, I do have a playlist now um where i put all the all the teachings that specifically address death nice. um, Brilliant. Thank so you. people can find them Brilliant. easy and you know, I, I, I was going to say just a little bit about death and the, God, the three of us here. I mean, I knew I knew of Roger, okay, and I'd read his books, and when I was a student of transpersonal psychology, and then the integral world, he was he was always there, 
And uh, two, I guess it was about three years ago, we were at a conference in Hungary and I had just lost my parents and had a massive heart attack like a couple of months before. Uh, and so I was really close to it. And Roger had just lost his wife, Frances, of many, many years. And so we just, uh, we just started talking and somehow that opened, you know, we just felt like, you know, I don't know what we felt, but it was really, it was really holy and good. And uh, I think somewhere after that, I said, you know, well, maybe we could do a podcast because I've done some of this stuff before. And I thought if I could get Roger talking in front of a, you know, a video on, on a podcast, that would be a great service to the world. And uh, yeah, so it just kind of started that way. Uh, having a chance to birth something, but I think it was in the in the, the recognition of death and, and my almost death and, and the death of people that I deeply loved uh, and still miss uh, that, that started this thing. And it became clear to me that the other motivation, uh, well, it's probably the original one, is that uh, I want to hang out with people that make me want to be a better person. And uh, Roger's, you know, dedication to practice and scholarship and all this deeply and humility deeply inspires me. And the people that we've been speaking to also have gifts to give. You know, they, they have medicine for, our, you know, our hurting human family. And um, the same thing with you, Jai Shar. It's, it's uh, uh, I'm a musician also, among other things, and I'm a CEO of BioWake Technologies, and we create meditation tools and use brain entrainment and guided meditation and stuff. So I can, from a professional thing, I can also appreciate what you're doing and the depths of, of the timing is so perfect. And it's un, unstriven far, I'm sure, but it's just there. So, um, yeah, death got this party together in, in a very profound way. And uh, it's just a gift that keeps giving, I guess. And certainly within the spiritual practice, uh, there is a need to die before you die, as they say. You know, we have to die to this belief that um, we are these mortal forms or these personalities. And so th th contemplating the, the physical body is a, a something that is going to well, not so much die, but go back to its uh, elements is an opportunity to really um, die to our beliefs and our views and delusions. And, you know, so it's, it has, the death contemplation has such breadth and depth to it, you know. It's not just about looking at a, a physical body dying. It, it's uh, the whole ego thing has to come into the fore. And I think most people who have powerful uh, spiritual awakenings, often it's related to an ego death, you know. And that's, that's what uh, propels someone so, so uh, powerfully on this path if they, if they have a, an ego death experience and get through it okay. There needs to be support through that. And yet... The contemplations of death are really challenging. They're some of the most challenging of all. And, and, and it seems like different people open or accept death more easily than others. For myself, I know, despite having done decades of practice, I'm not complete with it. I still have anxiety, uh, um, incompleteness around, around my own death. And so it's, it can be very challenging. Yeah, that's, that's why it's powerful, because there's an assumption that you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and who are you? you? You know, and that's why you know, Ramana was always pointing people. Well, who, who do you think's going to die? Is, are you the body? Are you these thoughts, these personalities, these proclivities? And that was his own awakening, wasn't it? He laid, you know, the story of Ramana at sixteen, lying on the ground in his um, home in India, um, consciously imagining himself dying. And it was so powerful. It actually he had the physical. Um, experience of the body actually dying for a time there so he, like he had a, a near-death experience if you like but it wasn't in an accident or an illness it was purely through his conscious intention to contemplate death 
And then because he bravely and courageously faced his own death and with an inquisitive mind, but with a powerful refuge in awareness, he, he saw the body dying. He saw the elements dissolving or experienced it. He saw the, the mind and the thoughts kind of doing what they do, which at the moment of death, they will break down and no one will have a sense of their personality anymore. But he, his awareness was so powerful that he was the observer through all of that and realized that nothing actually dies. The pure awareness is, is the deathless realm. And so he took refuge in that. And that's why he was willing to drop his body there and then and left home and went and got eaten by rats in the cave because <laughs> he didn't care about the body anymore. And uh, he was just, he was in either samadhi or just transcendent, transcended the physical realm and realized the, the deathless. Uh, and that's why he was fearless because it was like, he wasn't, he wasn't attached anymore as an identity to, to a body mind. And um you know, that's why his teachings are so pure and beautiful because he was he he was the reality or he called it the self didn't he yeah. and and perhaps it's appropriate <clears throat> to just mention that that death is also simultaneously a rebirth to a different identity and that's one way of looking at the at the goal of practice is to shift from an identification with the mind and its belief system, which constitutes the separate self sense or ego as we, as we call it. But in that dissolution or disidentification, then there's the possibility of recognizing that which is always already present behind or prior to yeah, the thoughts. Yeah. And well, as long as it doesn't become a new identity, that's the problem too, is that people then start to pick it up as a, as a thing or a, a new identity. I am the self, I am, the, you know, and there's all this subtle duality still going on or there's not a real willingness to die completely to it all if one picks it up as a new identity or a new attainment, you know, and that's why these masters, you know, they've died, they're, they're, they're empty vessels. You know, but there's, and there's, for most of us, it's a, it needs to be a repeated process of a, a death to one belief system, but then yeah. the uh, ego or the mind uh, very skillfully recreates it's a new, more subtle, more exalted uh, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> and and delusion is so subtle, isn't it? You know, we can the, we can delude, be so deluded in such a subtle way and... Uh, and, uh, you know, especially on the spiritual path, people thinking that they're, they're attained and they're fully enlightened and it's obvious they're not, you know. Well, and, uh, that's a, that's a trap when anyone <laughs> makes that yeah. claim. As our yeah, friend yeah. Uh, Ken Wilbur once said, I know 10 people who think they're the only fully enlightened people on the planet. I just want to get them in a room together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> really? Yeah. So yeah, there's so many subtle traps on this, but the and I think you know the the real ego death is not something you'd be kind of dancing around ex exclaiming to people as if you've got something, you know. It it, it knocks one the, one it one knocks the yeah. complete wind out of you. <laughs> yeah, and and you mentioned that the 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 inevitability almost it seems or at least in my experience it feels inevitable getting caught in caught in ever more subtle uh trances uh, that uh, yeah. one can think oh wow far out i've i've seen that and <laughs> then you know, whatever you're seeing from is the next yeah. <laughs> is the next seduction yeah, uh, yeah completely <laughs> keep, keep on clinging to something or memory you know it's just we just don't want to let go yeah. But you know, sometimes I think when we're giving our gifts and there's a moment of freedom there and ego death, you know, we're not tripping about how wonderful we are, what's coming through or this. We're just the universe giving what this particular part of it was, was made to give. And that's a, it's a beautiful, holy thing. And then, of course, we can make our stories and jump all over it afterwards. But when it's in the process and it's just just coming through, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty beautiful and very holy and, and uh, pretty free. Yeah. Jay, Sarah, what, what's calling you now? You've 
spent years putting these readings together. Uh, I know you in a very short time will be going into retreat for a period of time. Uh, is there uh, is there something new or that's calling? What's what's your sense of what's next for you? I have no idea, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what the day will bring, what the next day will bring. I, yeah, I do have a plan to go into retreat on uh, in a few days' time. And uh, I'm really open to that because I'm going to a local Tibetan's uh, centre, which is just reopening after COVID. So I kind of have the whole place to myself. And it's at the foothill of a sacred mountain, an uh, 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 Aboriginal mountain, uh, mother mountain called Gulaga. And uh, the Tibetan centre has kindly uh, allowed me to go and practice in one of their samadhi huts. So I'm going into the great unknown there. And it was a centre where Namkai Norbu, you know, the great yeah, uh, Rinpoche, and he, uh, he started that centre and he moved on from that. But uh, I'm really kind of feeling very uh, excited about going into the space where Namkai Norbu um, the place he established as well as the sacredness of the Aboriginal energy around that place. So that's all I have in mind at the moment, just the next, um, the next period of time that's going to open up for me. And, and this mountain that we live near is very, very powerful. So uh, we'll see what happens. And then I, you know, come back to our little hermitage and see what life presents then uh, plan on continuing if life uh, allows it you know if I'm still alive I've got to contemplate death every day um, you know I keep doing whatever readings present themselves Beautiful. but that's as so, far as my plans and ambitions go <laughs> <laughs> well that simplifies things <laughs> uh, it's pretty simple I got a pretty yeah. simple life and it's and it's beautiful. There's uh, there's an idea in so many traditions of the cycle of withdrawal and return that we go into yeah. ourselves to question ourselves and the great issues of life, and and we then we go out into the world to offer what we've found, and we ideally we use our going back into the world as a practice which enables us to go deeper. And it sounds like that's the life you've devoted yourself to. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel having done these recordings, you know, I think I started the first one maybe two years ago now. I, I can hear the difference in my voice too uh, over two years. Um, and certainly the the resonance of the, the, the teachings have gone in even more powerfully. And what's interesting, sometimes I let my MP3 play a random play and it might play an old teaching recording I did and I haven't heard for ages. And it's, and again, it can blow me away and often does. And it's like, wow, I read that probably 18 months ago. That's incredible, that teaching. And it goes in and a, a new level. And it's like the, the, the layers of the onion just keep peeling back. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, so how, how, how many layers of depth can it go? Well, it does seem that that's one of the hallmarks of a really profound teaching that that each time you listen to it, you're able to recognize or attune to deeper, more deeper layers of meaning and significance. And yeah, they, see, they seem bottomless. Yeah, exactly. It's like, that's why, is this ever going to stop? And it just it keeps going. And, you know, and it's different layers, but it's also different angles, isn't it? You sort of... I don't know, it just sort of seemed to come at it from a different perspective. And there are so many layers, even within one particular phrase or teaching that uh, you can access. Uh, so it just shows you the depth of the Buddha's wisdom. You know, he said, he, he, shared, he shared with us just a, a handful of leaves and how much he had that he wasn't going to bother, you know, sharing it with but it was that's how immense his uh, his knowledge his understanding of, of dharma was mm. this has been so rich and so beautiful uh, jess Har, is there anything else you'd like to bring up or john do you have other questions i have one little technical question because i'm so fascinated with the power of what you're producing do you listen to the music when you do the readings or do you add the music uh, not, not anymore. I used to when I had um I had a really dodgy microphone when I first started, and I was just finding my way 
with a new, um, you know, that free audacity um, thing that you can download. So I was just getting the hang of it. And um, <clears throat> they used to take me ages to do because I'd listen and play the music and then I'd think I have to have a lot of different music tracks, which I don't do that anymore. So now I just read and then I just listen to it and I and then I think that one doesn't need music. You know, I've got a whole playlist of no music ones um, and that's just, I just go and feel. Some of them just are better with no music and, I, you know, there's a bit of debate out there. Some people think you should have music, you shouldn't have music, whatever. I just go and feel and then um, it's a bit like the reading. I just, I've got this massive music library now and musicians send me their music too that I can use because in the earlier days I used to use, and I, I was completely green, I used to use copyrighted music on YouTube, which you're allowed to do, but it means they can play ads on your videos. So, um, and that's not great if it's a meditation, right? And it, <laughs> it, 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 make, it makes money for the music musos, which is completely fair enough. So now I'm trying not to use copyrighted music. And so a lot of musicians send me their music to use. So I've got the mass, this massive music library, which I never listen to because I don't listen to music as a, a Buddhist nun. In this tradition, you're kind of, you're not supposed to anyway. Um, but I wouldn't consider this music a lot of what I have. It's more, you know, it's kind of sacred mantras and sounds. So um, I just let, I don't know, just it comes. I, there's, there's, I don't have a, a structure. I couldn't explain how it happens. It just a bit presents itself but obviously for something like the Chinese teachings I go to my Zen library and try and context, give the right context for it and for St John of the Cross I had a sort of a Christian sounding soundtrack so that it's not totally incongruous with the teaching but it just it presents itself I don't I don't have I don't know what's going to come but then well, I'll listen I'll listen and I'll think yeah, that works. And I give it to the other sister and she goes, no, I don't like that one. Try another one. We just play around. And sometimes well, I get it in one. Sometimes I struggle. You know, I think, oh, that one's, I'm just going to put that one aside. And I often pray to them. I go, okay, St. John, please send me the music you want. Yes. <laughs> well, however you do it, it works. <laughs> and it's an exquisite collection. And oh, good, uh, good. Uh, I want to thank you personally, because it's been just an incredible gift for me and my practice and for right. many friends that I've, <laughs> I've sent your links to. And but I also want to thank you for the whole spiritual community because you are now reaching an enormous number of people. I think you mentioned you had 50,000 subscribers is clearly growing at an enormous rate. You're reaching and touching many, many people and many mm. lives and deepening practice and offering some of the greatest gifts that humankind has, uh, has brought down or that these great masters have have realized the depths of human possibilities and spoken as best they can their discoveries their insights their depths and you're making them available in another whole way which is just a priceless gift to us all i want to uh, acknowledge again your your uh, on both youtube and on multiple podcast platforms the title is under your name samaniri jayasara and the title of the series is Wisdom of the Masters, and I encourage everyone to uh, to l jump over to to listen and take some time to imbibe the beauty of and wisdom and profundity of these these teachings and this transmission, and it really is a transmission. And I also encourage you to uh, support JSR and her, her hermitage and the the creation of these this wonderful reservoir and and cornucopia for us all Jasara, it has been a a delight to have this conversation with you thank you personally and on behalf of us all what a gift you are and what a gift you're giving us all you're all very welcome roger and john <laughs> thanks Thank thanks for having me on and uh yeah. nice to connect with you and it, it does seem funny that uh 35 years ago, I was quoting you, Roger. So must 
I must pull out my old thesis and have a look what you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to touch you the way the read your readings do. I can guarantee you that. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, you know, no, nothing is separate, is it? It's all it's all interconnected. It's one yeah. thing leads to another. So it's kind of interesting. I I I uh, I benefited enormously from your clarity of writing this whole around this whole area many years ago and now we're kind of coming around to connect again so it's lovely it's beautiful <laughs> thank you so much you're welcome nice to connect